Welcome to this enhanced podcast from Enlightening Science, the outreach wing of the Newton Project at Sussex University. We're dedicated to providing resources to help improve the understanding of Isaac Newton, his importance to both his own time and ours, his influence and his thought. I'm with Jim Bennett, director of the Oxford Museum of the History of Science. Jim is an expert on scientific instruments from the 16th through to the 18th centuries, and today he's going to be speaking on the Newtonian telescope. One of the most iconic um, material objects related to Newton, well, there are, there are several, but and one will be a prism, I suppose, which, is, which indicates Newton's interest in optics and, uh, and refraction in particular. But the other would be his little telescope, that, that very stumpy little telescope which is done at the Royal Society. Well, there's a version of it in the Royal Society. Instrument uh, experts argue over exactly its status and its relationship with Newton. But certainly, that the construction of the Newtonian telescope is something that Newton explains in optics. There's a very clear diagram there about how the Newtonian reflecting telescope works. And that's an important precedent. Op the Newton's optics of, of 1704 is an important precedent for the way telescopes are going to develop in the, in the 18th century. But they take several different routes from the starting point that Newton presents in, in optics. One of the reasons why people um, develop that side of, uh, of, of, of Newton's legacy is that it's popular. Um, you can enjoy yourself making telescopes, you can enjoy yourself using them and so on. So there are all sorts of publics who will be interested in this. There are the astronomers, of course, but there's also a broad public who will, who will be interested in the, ref in the reflecting telescope and the reflecting telescope in particular. When Newton presents his construction of a, re a reflecting telescope in optics, he wants it to do two things, one of which historians of science remember and celebrate, the other of which they've largely forgotten. So we'll start with the one that they've forgotten, because Newton heads that chapter in optics to shorten telescopes, in other words, to make telescopes much shorter than they generally are. What he's getting at there is that Telescopes are refracting telescopes for the most part in the late 17th century. Let's say they're, they're, their optical components are lenses. And to counteract one or two problems with uh, refracting telescopes, they have become very long. They use uh, objective lenses which have very long focal length. So the telescopes have become very long. They've become very difficult to manage. By long, I mean them, in England, they're up to 60 feet in length. Now, if you have a 60-foot telescope, you don't have a very good mounting. You don't really know what you're pointing at. It's very susceptible to the wind and weather and so on. It's really pretty unmanageable. So that's a practical problem, and Newton says, well, we can make them shorter if we move from the refractor to the reflector. The other thing that Newton uh, promotes in, in optics is, a, is at its root, an, an optical at advantage, because one of the, the reason why the refractor is, is, has become so long is that you want to minimize the refraction of the, of the lens, the bending of the light by the lens. And if you minimize that, you get a very long telescope, a very long focal length. And the reason why you want to do that is you don't want to disperse the light too much into its various colors. And Newton has a story about why there is a rainbow effect, you know, why there is dispersion into colors. And he says that that's because the light is incident, the incident light is, is a mixture of all sorts of colored reds. And they're refracted differently once they're, once, they're, once they're bent and they separate out. And there's no way, Newton says, you can get them back together again because uh, the degree of dispersion and the degree of refraction are so closely related that you'll never get them back together again. So the only solution then, the way to get around that uh, chromatic aberration, as opticians call it, is to use reflection instead of refraction. So you have, a, you have a, a, sh a short telescope and one made of mirrors as its principal components instead of lenses. There's another interesting precedent in uh, the optics, which becomes very influential in the way the reflector um, develops. Newton tells you how he made his own, and it was very much how he made his own. He, 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 these, these are metal mirrors, by the way. They're not made of glass, silver, the way we might expect now. They're made of a metal alloy, and you, you grind them to shape, and then you polish them. And Newton does that himself. And he tries to tell you how he does it, and in the end he says, well, to be honest, I'm, I'm doing my best to explain this, but 
really it's, it's better if you try it yourself because it's very hard to explain this in words. And, the, and that's a problem all the way through the 18th century, how you explain this mechanical skill. But that set a precedent for many uh, philosophers and um, natural philosophers and mathematicians in the early uh, 18th century, like Robert Smith and uh, James Bradley and John Hadley and so on. There was very senior uh, uh, mathematicians in the academic world and in the world of the Royal Society. But they were perfectly prepared. In fact, they seemed very much to enjoy rolling up their sleeves and getting to work on a, a, on a, a, at a bench, grinding away with their mirrors and polishing them. And uh, so, so that, no, that idea of there being a mechanical uh, uh, practice which was pursued by these mathematicians um, is very unusual, but characteristic of the, of the reflector th after the Newtonian precedent in optics right through the um, 18th century. There's another very important development of the telescope in the 18th century, which also happens mainly in England and is also, in a sense, Newtonian. It works within a Newtonian context, but it reaches a conclusion which, is, which, which disproves Newton's fundamental notion, which as I explained, was that refraction and dispersion go together with a certain amount of degree of uh, dispersion, uh, refraction, bending of light, you get a, a certain degree of dispersion into the different colors. Um, and that was the same for all medium. Media it didn't matter what, what, what the uh, refracting medium was. Now, optics is very popular. A lot of people are, 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 are in, involved with telescopes, with putting telescopes together. It's becoming a fashionable, pers fashionable pursuit. It's very much not just in the universities. It's very much out in the commercial uh, world of instrument makers in London and so on. And one of the people who's affected by this is a man called John Dolland, who's a, a, a silk weaver in Spitalfields, so a very unfashionable area of London, uh, engaged in a mechanical commercial trade. But this is the sort of person who, in the spare time, is interested in optics. Uh, he undertakes a series of experiments which he proves to his satisfaction that Newton was wrong. That's to say that um, you can have different types of uh, refracting media, different types of glass, which for the same refractive uh, properties will have different dispersive properties. And, and that means that what John Dolan's able to do is have a, a combination of two lenses, a convex lens, what we call a positive lens, and a concave lens, a negative lens, puts them together. One's made of crown glass, the, but the negative lens is made of high dispersive flint glass. And that, because it's a negative lens, that has the effect of counteracting, well, it counteracts the refractive properties, of course, of the uh, positive lens, so the focal length's longer than it would be, just if there was only a positive lens. But, but differentially, it counteracts the dispersive properties. So you end up with a longer focal length, but achromatic lens, or achromatic doublet, as opticians would say, because there are two lenses that work together. And that puts the refractor back on the map again, so to speak, because you can then have a, a refractor which doesn't create a fuzzy image with colored fringes. And, but what's interesting about that practice is that whereas the mathematicians desperately, well, not desperately want, but they're very keen on being mechanics and following the Newtonian tradition of practical manipulation and experimental practice, these real mechanics, who, uh, Whose whole, whose whole livelihoods depends on, 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 on mechanical and commercial success, they, and that is desperate, they desperately want to be mathematicians because they need that, the security of being able to show that Newton had been wrong and that that, that, that demonstration is based on, on, on new discoveries in uh, mathematical optics. Um, so, so all of Dolan's presentation of himself, and then more particularly the defense of his father's memory and his father's patent, as, as it turned out, and so on, and his, and his father's uh, uh, results by his son Peter after Dolan's death. And of course, as you know, as everyone knows, because the, the name survives, the Dolans are very successful in, in, in telescope making. Their reputation for making telescopes is, uh, is very... Um, is, is, uh, you know, very successful and their, their commercial practice is successful. But, but Peter Dolland is absolutely uh, determined that that's based on the mathematical achievements of his father, not the mechanical achievements. So there's a curious reversal here.
between the mathematicians who practice being mechanics and the mechanics who want to be mathematicians. But the whole thing falls within this Newtonian optical discourse which is established by the optics in 1704. This podcast has been an enlightening science production from the University of Sussex. The sound recordist was Lucy Cook. It was edited by Lucy Cook and Pete Langman. The producer was Pete Langman.